Hi, everyone. Welcome back. We are moving into a brand new subject within the field of biological anthropology today, and that is primatology, um, which studies the living primate order. So we're also going to go back in time and look at the evolution of primates here soon, um, but we're going to meet the living primates first. Um, the living primate order um, is studied by what's called a primatologist. So primatologists study living primate physical and behavioral traits, both in captivity and in the wild to better understand primate differences and similarities and to protect them. Um, so we're going to be looking, we're gonna break this up into a few sections. In the living uh, primates PowerPoint, which you are uh, hopefully have open right now, we're going to be looking at what makes a primate a primate. You know, what, um, traits do you have to have in order to be included in the primate order among the Linnaean taxonomy. Um, we're going to uh, focus primarily on those physical traits. And then we're going to get a little bit more specific to unique specializations that certain species have. And this is an assignment that you'll do in the class as well. Um, we're then going to do a, an entire separate section on primate behavior. Um, and the purpose of primatology is um, to, to do a few things. So we're understanding primate differences and similarities, particularly human and non-human primates. We want to understand what we share, where we're different, right? And where those differences and, and similarities may have diverged in um, evolutionary history. But one of the biggest reasons that we um, study primates is to protect them. Um, basically every single primate of the two to 300 primates. So, um, you know, depending on, on how a primatologist is classifying them, there's anywhere between 200 and 300 species of primates. Um, and almost all of them have some sort of um, extinction, endangerment threat to them. Um, so 60% of primates are already threatened or near extinction with 75% having rapidly declining populations. And so I, I, I try to open this lecture up um, to talk a little bit about captivity. So primates are of course studied in the wild where possible, but keep in mind that um, there's a wide range of things happening in the wild that are causing these populations to decline, including human encroachment, um, deforestation, uh, you know, for the sake of land, but also for the sake of products like palm oil, you know, which is something that's leading to the rapid endangerment and near extinction of the orangutan. Um, and so, you know, we have uh, poaching, we have a bushmeat industry, we have a, 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 um, a black market sale of these primates as infants, you know, so that people can have them in their homes. And you'd be shocked um, how many of them end up in Los Angeles. This is actually a huge hub for illegal captivity of these primates that are being traded around the world. So it can be very difficult actually to study these primates in the wild. Um, other things that make this difficult may be uh, political issues. So most of the research, let's say done on gorillas has been done uh, primarily in captivity because it's been generations and generations of um, political and war conflict um, in the area of Central Africa where gorillas are found, um, that it, it's extremely difficult to actually get into those particular areas. Um, but considering all of the things, climate change, human encroachment, poaching, the bushmeat industry, the illegal trade of living primates, um, you know, captive programs have evolved out of that. Now, let me preface this by saying that all zoos in the world are not okay. Um, and you want to look at the reviews of places you go where animals may be held in captivity everywhere that you go in the world. Um, and hopefully you can understand through our lecture a couple of the signs that you're going to be looking for um, that would indicate that that is not a safe place for animals. But um, many, many places in the world, refuges and in the United States, especially where it's heavily regulated, zoos um, offer very important breeding and reintroduction programs to safe locations. So 
Estimates suggest that over 30,000 primates are trafficked each year, often abandoned once they reach sexual maturity. So this is one of the reasons that primates end up in captivity. Um, for every live baby chimp that becomes a victim of the illegal trade, as many as 10 other chimps have been killed in the process. So this is something that um, when we study primate behavior, when we study primates in the wild, we can understand how to prevent this. But it's also one of the reasons why we don't just find these infants, right, um, and reintroduce them back into their wild locations. You know, I often hear this about zoos, and you'll get extra credit for going and viewing primates at the zoo. Um, and sometimes I get the emails, right, well, I don't believe in this, and I don't agree with this. And, and um, you know, I want to clarify that while um, that is a, a good um, approach to take, right, be critical of these organizations, please know that um, captivity in zoos is often for the betterment of that particular species. Um, when baby chimps come in um, as a product of illegal trade, for instance, or any primates come in as a product of illegal trade, um, they are not capable of being put back into the wild effectively, um, especially not right away. If they haven't had contact with other members of their species, then they haven't socialized property. They don't properly, they don't understand how to survive in that environment, how to access food. And so oftentimes zoos are doing one of two things. They are either helping to gradually integrate them into their species, give them the skills they need so that they can be reintroduced usually not to the wild, but a refuge in those areas of the world. So if we're returning a chimpanzee, let's say to Central Africa, we're not releasing them into the wild so that they can be poached right away for their bushmeat. Um, instead, they're being sent to a protected refuge where they can live out the rest of their existence in that area. But it's it's not as easy as just dropping them off, right? Um, they need to develop skills over time in order to do that. Um, captive programs also help with breeding to ensure um, that we might be able to save these species uh, in the future. So always some good things to look out for. And one that I really wanted to share with you is the Gibbon Conservation Center, which is actually up in Santa Clarita. Um, and you can visit this for extra credit. There's a whole new documentary out um, about this particular place. And it's one of the, the most amazing um, captive breeding and release um, programs in, in SoCal, as far as I'm concerned, because gibbons are my favorite. Um, they are a highly traded animal as well because they are adorable, um, but you know they get dumped often. And so this, uh, you know, you're visiting this facility, your donations to this facility um, facilitate the uh, transition of these um, animals back into um, a gibbon conservation uh, refuge in Indonesia, I believe. So um, check this out, maybe pause, watch this, feel free to watch the documentary and definitely go visit. It's an absolutely incredible place that um, it, we were afraid was going to be lost here soon, but is now uh, they've been able to purchase their land and they're gonna stay and be a great protective captive place um, to help um, protect gibbons. So maybe take a second, pause, All right, so I'm off my high horse. Let's get into uh, the living primates. So I'm going to break this lecture up into a few sections, a couple sections. Um, the first one is going to be what makes a primate a primate. So primates have, um, um, to be a member of the primate order, we're looking for some of the following traits. Some of these traits are 100% distinctive to the primate order. Others are uh, uh, traits that we tend to see in combination that not necessarily all primates have, but usually almost all primates have. Um, and I'll give some examples of that here in a moment. So one thing that every single primate has, it's a distinctive trait of our order, is called the petrosal bulla um, in the ear region. And what you're seeing here is just kind of a raised bony, um, uh, two bony kind of lumps or projections that protect the ear region of the skull. This is inferior. This is what you're seeing from underneath uh, the skull. A second trait that is distinctively primate. So um, when you take your quizzes on this material, um, you'll be doing skull identification. And one of the um, questions that I may ask you is, is this a primate or not? So one of the things that you want to look at right away is what's called the post-orbital bar. So in this left image here, you're seeing what's called the post-orbital bar. All of these have a post-orbital bar, actually. But um, the post-orbital bar is a bony ring that fully 
in circles or in cases, the eye. Um, if this is present, it is a primate, regardless of if it doesn't look like a primate otherwise. Um, the postorbital bar is a distinctively primate trait. Now, primates also have what we call heterodont teeth. So this is a primate trait, um, meaning that um, unlike other species, like uh, let's say a dog that has, um, you know, homodont teeth or a single style of tooth uh, throughout the jaw, primates have heterodont teeth. We have incisors, canines, premolars, and molars. And what this means is that primates can then consume a much wider range of foods, um, including insects, fruits, and leaves. Um, we also see a little bit of meat eating among some of the higher order primates, but this, um, these are primarily the, the foods that you're gonna see primates eating. Now primates have heterodont teeth, but individual species tend to have unique specializations on their heterodont teeth depending on what they, they are eating primarily. So in um, an activity and assignment that you're going to do in this class is primate adaptations. You're going to be looking at what makes um, your primate of choice, right? So you get to choose a primate from the list. Um, and then you're going to tell me what makes this primate a primate, right? Well, let's say you choose um, a, a gorilla. So what makes your gorilla a primate is that it has heterodont teeth, but it also has some unique specializations that allows it to survive in its environment. And gorillas are primarily leaf eaters. So when you look at their teeth, what you're going to find is that they have somewhat sharp molars and premolars. And the reason for this specialization is because all the good nutritious stuff is actually, of course, inside of that leaf and you have to break through a lot of those fibrous structures on the outside in order to get that nutrition. So a specialization for uh, primates that are primarily leaf eaters are slightly sharpened molars in order to break that down. You're also going to find that leaf eaters tend to be larger and they have long digestive tracts. And that is absolutely true of a gorilla. Um, that is because um, it's very difficult for the body to break down leaves um, and to pull nutrition from them. So the longer the digestive tract, the more likely, um, the more nutrition that animal or species will be able to extract from that particular diet. So again, for your assignment, what makes a gorilla a primate is that they have heterodont teeth, but they have heterodont teeth with specializations for their environment. And those are what we see here in our leaf eating primate. Now, insect primates tend to be nocturnal, um, and they tend to be small, um, and they are going to have the sharpest molars of all because insects have exoskeletons, and you have to break through those to get those nutrients on the inside of that exoskeleton. They also tend to be small-bodied because if you're going to be getting insects, you know, it's much easier to do so um, when you're small and you can be quiet and stealthy. Insects are also incredibly nutrient rich, so you don't need a large body with a long digestive tract. You're able to get that nutrient, uh, those nutrients very quickly. Fruits are kind of in the middle. Um, for primates that are strictly fruit eaters like orangutans, um, they have specializations of crushing molars. So their molars are relatively flat um, and that allows them to grind the seeds in those fruits. Now, um, uh, these primates tend to have about medium sized bodies. You get a lot of nutrition from um, fruits, but you don't tend to have a lot of it available. Primates also have prehensile hands, grasping hands. That's what prehensile means, usually with an opposable thumb, five total digits. So, um, generally speaking, most primates, about 99% of them, have prehensile hands with opposable thumbs and five digits. There's a couple exclusions to that. You can see here the colobus monkey um, and also the spider monkey are missing their thumb. But otherwise, they have these primate traits. Now, these, of course, are going to be helpful in living in an arboreal environment, which is likely why primates have them. Now, depending on the primate that you choose for your assignment, you can say this is a primate because they have these features. But notice how different primate hands look just from this image alone. And that's because each primate hand, while it has these generalized traits, also has some specializations that are unique to their method of locomotion. So that's what you'll look for in terms of specialization with the primate that you've chosen. 
Now, some other things about the hands that primates have are nail beds, nails instead of claws, and tactile pads. Um, what this means is you have these beautiful little lines, right? Um, and no, they don't mean anything about who you're gonna marry or how rich you're gonna be. Um, they are genetically predetermined, just like your fingerprints. Um, and they are there for extra grip, right? Grasping grip. Um, nails, uh, instead of claws, right? Nails are shorter and they're also going to um, increase the sensitivity of the tips of the fingers. The large majority of our sensory information actually comes through our hands. Um, and so these are two traits that you're gonna see among all primates. Primates have erect posture and uh, generalized locomotion with specialized locomotion patterns. So um, here's what I mean by that. All primates are capable of sitting and walking erect right, bipedally on two feet. Now, usually not for long periods of time, it's not very energy efficient for them, but they have the physical ability to do that. They have an erect posture. Primates also tend to be able to locomote or move around in many different ways, right? And this is an adaptive thing. So if they need to be on the ground, they can. If they need to be in the trees, they can. But primates species tend to have unique specializations in their locomotion pattern, depending on their particular environment. So when you take a quiz on this material, images like these will pop up and I will ask you, um, you know, or make you choose, uh, depending on how the question is formatted, um, what type of locomotion is present in this particular image. So let's look at the kind of four primary methods of locomotion among non-human primates. On the left, we have um, what is a vertical clinger and a leaper. So in a vertical clinger and a leaper, what you're going to find is that um, while they can do multiple things, right? They can walk on the ground, they can climb, they can leap, which is a trait that we see among primates and they have erect posture. Um, they tend to have specializations in the legs and feet. So leapers are going to be pressing off. They're gonna be using the long length of their feet to push off and jump forward or jump backwards, which means that you're going to see very long, strong feet and extremely long legs comparatively to shorter arms. Now, the opposite is the case with our brachiator on the right-hand side. A brachiator is a distinctive method of locomotion for apes. And you'll notice that this ape is actually hanging, this is a gibbon, hanging from the branch. So unlike a leaper, whose primary method of locomotion is using their feet to propel them, the gibbon, a brachiator, is using their arms to propel them like this. And so you're going to see significantly longer arms and hands than you are legs, the exact opposite of a clinger and a leaper. Now in the middle here at the top is an arboreal primate, which means quadrupedal walking in the trees, right? Or use, living primarily in the trees. A quadruped, um, the term that you see here uh, is, this is a, a terrestrial quadruped on the ground, meaning that they walk on four feet. So there's not a huge amount of differences in these images, right? But there's a couple things to keep in mind. Arboreal primates that live almost exclusively in the trees um, are going to have specializations to prevent them from falling and losing their balance. And what that means is they're going to have equal length limbs. So all four legs are generally in an arboreal primate going to be the same length. And there's a reason for this. We want the torso to remain relatively parallel to the branch. If a clinger and a leaper is trying to walk on a branch, right, it's probably going to tip forward because its center of gravity is here. If a brachiator is trying to walk on a branch, its center of gravity is here. It's also probably going to tip, right? We want basic physics here, right? We want that spinal cord, we want that torso to be relatively parallel um, to the branch so that the a uh, primate can lower itself to the branch as well um, and keep itself balanced. You'll also see among arboreal quadrupeds a tail um, that has a lot of musculature in it that is going to be used um, for balance. Sometimes these grasp, sometimes they don't. But an arboreal primate is always going to have a larger tail that's going to help them balance, right, the way you would use your arms to balance when you're walking on a line.
Now, if you look below, the terrestrial quadruped has lost that tail. Um, and the reason for that is because they don't need it. They're not balancing. Terrestrial means to live on the ground. So they're not balancing in the trees. They still tend to have relatively equally length legs, um, but notice a couple differences. Um, the tail is gone. So they're going to lose this tail generally in favor for a larger sized body. And instead of having very long grasping fingers, the way our arboreal primate does, you know, in order to grasp on in the trees, they're going to have shorter fingers and they're going to walk generally on the tips of those fingers. This is called digitigrade, digit grade. Um, and so whatever primate you choose for the assignment that you're going to do, you can say what makes your primate um, a primate is that they have erect posture and they tend to be able to move around um, in a wide variety of ways, but they have developed specialized methods of locomotion for their particular environment like brachiation. And then you can describe the traits um, that change in that species for them to do brachiation. Primates also have larger brains with a larger neocortex and what we call greater encephalization. So overall, the size of the brain compared to the body tends to be larger among primates, but especially the brain tends to be larger than the face in the cranium. So note on the right-hand side here, on the left is a gibbon, on the right is a red wolf. So where my cursor is, this is the cranial area of the wolf. This is where the brain is housed. And then this is the cranial area of the gibbon. Note that these two species have the same sized brains, but a gibbon, uh, excuse me, a red wolf is six times the physical size of the gibbon. This means that the primate is greater encephalized. We have a, we have a larger brain compared to the size of our bodies, but we also have a larger brain compared to the face, right? Look at the amount of face, right, compared to the cranium of the red wolf. And then when we look at the gibbon, you can see that the cranium is actually larger than the face of the gibbon. These tend to be traits of primates. Now, primates also have a more expansive neocortex. Neocortex is where um, all this higher order thinking is going to come into play. It's going to be much more new, um, um, neuron dense, particularly dopamine sensitive neurons, which are going to facilitate learning, social behavior, and all sorts of things that primates, great, primates gain intellectually, cognitively um, in the evolution of the primate brain, which we're going to look at later in the semester as well. Um, so the neocortex of primates has greater cognitive abilities arguably than um, mammals, right? To which we are a member of, but then we branch off into the primate order and especially reptiles. So we have a, the lizard brain, the reptilian brain, the brain stem essentially um, is very basic, right? Mammals get a more expansive um, cognitive set of abilities um, through a, a, a greater neocortex themselves. You'll see mostly emotional elements added to the mammalian brain. Now, um, the problem with that is, of course, that um, while these emotions are, are present, the ability to control them is, is not um, all that great, right? I have a dog, uh, for instance, that I brought, uh, that she lives with me now. We've had her for about nine months. She came from a hoarding situation um, and, you know, she is very dog aggressive. And I tell her every day, you know, and we're working on it slowly. She's getting a little bit better, right? But I'm, I tell her, you know, if you could just control yourself, we could go for walks. You could come everywhere with us, but you can't right now because you are a psychopath, right? Um, but she can't understand that. All she knows is her emotions and her reactions. So our training has to work with that in mind. Primates gain um, in the neocortex a, a, a greater sense of logic, rational thought analysis, and a control of impulse and emotions. Now, to varying degrees, of course, right? But these are new things that primates tend to have, um, generally speaking. Finally, primates have what we call stereoscopic or 3D vision, right? We have two eyes, um, each which collects information from one, right? Here's one eye, and then here's the second eye. This information is collected and it's brought back to the visual cortex 
where both images are then put together in a 3D image, allowing for a depth perception. Um, this is something that's going to be very important for um, you know, moving around in the trees quickly. Primates also start to exchange smell, a decreased sense of smell for an increased visual sense, um, particularly color vision, um, which is going to be found in what we call diurnal or primates that are active during the day. I'll end this little section with some social behaviors that primates have generally. Primates have longer gestation, meaning it takes longer for our babies to develop in utero. We also have less babies. Generally speaking, primates have one baby at a time. And the maturation of that baby is very slow comparatively to other species, right? Who are kind of, you know, a giraffe comes out and it's walking, you know, within a day or so. Primate babies take longer to mature. Um, and that's why we have less babies. We have one baby at a time so that we can dedicate more time to helping this baby mature, which means that it's extremely dependent on social living and learned behaviors among members of that group. And when we get to primate behavior, the PowerPoint, we're going to see just how important socialization is to the development of primates um, and, and primates that will survive uh, successfully in their environments or really anywhere. So um, hopefully that gives you an idea of, of what a primate is. You know, these, all of these traits combined, these generalized primate traits are things that we look for when we're classifying a primate. Um, all of them, uh, every single primate doesn't have every single one of these traits, right? Sometimes we're missing a thumb or sometimes a specialization has caused the loss of a particular trait. Um, and we have more primitive primates that are still a little bit more dependent on smell than more advanced um, or more recently evolved primates like apes. They're still primates because they have, right, that postorbital bar, that petrosal bulla. Um, and so you want to be able to understand um, and reiterate the general primate traits. But in the next lecture, which I'm going to move into here um, in a moment, we're going to look at how, uh, of what we call primate taxonomy. So now we're gonna break down the entire primate order, right? 200, 300 primates. We're going to start breaking them down into smaller and smaller, more specialized groups. That's what we'll do in the next section, um, this next lecture video. Um, if you have any questions, as always, please let me know. Otherwise I will see you here in a moment.